I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this, and he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. Everybody knows I've had points where I've lost everything. I've had to switch entire careers. And doing that is a lonely and scary feeling, no matter which way you're trying to reinvent yourself. So reinvent yourself, the book, I wrote this book just for people like me who really wanted to learn how to switch careers, not just once or twice, but I've had to do it probably 10 times. Reinvent Yourself is all about taking action, no matter where you are starting from. And in this book, I disclose how I, and also I tell dozens of stories of other people, how we've turned our lives around and how I know you can too, no matter where you're starting from, because I've started from the bottom. Whether you want to supplement your income with a little extra cash or replace your job, or even if you're looking for a way to fund your retirement or, or just simply your interests have changed and now you have to start from scratch in a new area of life, the book Reinvent Yourself will show you how. I've reserved a copy for anyone listening to this today that I'd like to ship to you for absolutely free. All you have to do is go to www.reinventbook.net. That's www.reinventbook.net. The tools are there. The opportunities are there. The gatekeepers are disappearing. It's possible to create the life you want. And I've talked to so many people about this, plus my own experience. So go to www.reinventbook.net right now. I'm excited about what this book can do for you. That's www.reinventbook.net. And I really appreciate any feedback as well on this. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. When I was reading this, and I know we're kind of skipping over what actually happened, but when I was reading this, there was one part of me that was a little bit sad for me. Of course, I'm going to bring it all back to me. I haven't really built up 20 years of siblings and cousins that are going to come to my side and find me the best doctors like I don't know if my kids are gonna you know be helping me the way you know or, you know I have some of the things that you, you have obviously I have a great uh, wife and uh, great and I have good friends but you had this mega support system that takes decades to build and I, I felt sorry for myself well, no, what if I get sick somebody else brought this up to me I don't even know who I could call but, like, and also I, what are the odds that this person is a me- I mean I, yeah, he wasn't neurologist. my neurologist <laughs> I mean it's just all these things like so yes you can say okay I'm I'm super jealous of Jeannie and if I get a brain tumor everyone's gonna abandon me <laughs> but that's not the point that's it's a weird, like, that's the weirdest kind of jealousy I've ever heard 
this story because it's a, such an amazing story. When we challenge what hasn't been done, we discover the science behind what's yet to come. That's what drives Bayer to find even better answers to today's best agricultural solutions. They're working with farmers to shape what's next, farms where all life grows together, crops that can help raise communities out of poverty, tools that help plants and farmers use less water. Bayer, science for a better life. Let's say you're ready to make that side hustle your main hustle. Now what? I can't recommend this highly enough. Start with the all-in-one marketing platform from MailChimp. That's what. It has everything you need all in one place to give your new business the strongest start with the right marketing. Jumpstart your business with easy-to-use tools like the number one email marketing solution, website builder, and social post scheduler. Learn more about the all-in-one marketing platform at MailChimp.com. Rolling. So I've got Jeannie Gaffigan on the podcast. Jeannie just wrote a book, When Life Gives You Pears, The Healing Power of Family, Faith, and Funny People, forward by the comedian Jim Gaffigan, which is your husband. And this is all about uh, this time when you had a six centimeter brain tumor and everything that happens, not only in terms of you know, the, from diagnosis to, you know, surgery, to all the complications, to, you know, the help from your, your family, particularly Jim and other family. And then how, uh, you dealt with your, your five children and your, your career and everything. But, uh, uh, it's almost like a guide to, if you have a serious life affecting illness, what things you should do. And I have to say, first off this book, was hilarious. I just thought oh, it was really thank funny. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, probably shouldn't have been as funny. I was just laughing throughout. So, not at you. No, I just you. think one of the things that we always forget is that, um, you know, life is funny. It's really hard, but I lo- most comedy comes from conflict, right? So there, there is nothing really. Everyone always talks things of um, you know taboo subjects as, in terms of like language or sexual content or whatever, but actually talking about, you know, having your husband have to feed you through a tube, it's kind of like taboo, right? But it's also really funny in a lot of ways. Well, I think that's what probably makes it funny. Like everybody is sick of, or I am sick of airplane jokes or dating jokes or whatever. Like, okay, we can all relate to that, but there's something we can also relate to we don't have to relate to your specific experience, but we can relate to hardship and like things that we're afraid of. Like what you went through, I'm sure everybody would be afraid of. I mean, we'll discuss the details of what you went through, but nobody wants to go through that. And, uh, you know, Jim uh, making up characters while he's doing your hair after you're coming back from the hospital, that that's funny. Or, or, I remember one thing Jim said on, it was either, it was probably in stand-up and on Conan, but he says basically he can never win an argument with you again because- I can you, play the brain tumor card. Right, you could just say, yeah. I just had a brain tumor, yeah. and then you win. Yes, that's my my go-to now. Right. That's so my card. We, we can all relate to that. And, he, and to some extent, comedy sometimes takes things to an extreme. He doesn't have to take it to an extreme. Like that's the, the real life is the extreme with, with, with you right now. So, yeah, I mean, I it's I never in a you know million years would have expected something like this to happen. I was I think that at the time this happened, I really was taking things that are in retrospect really not that big of a deal as like such a big deal all every day, and not really realizing that there's a much bigger deal around the corner, and it might not be a brain tumor, it might be a, a close friend or a, you know, it might not be yourself. It might be like a parent or there's something around the corner and how are we prepared for it? And that's not to say to live a life of gloom and doom and, oh, the worst thing's going to happen tomorrow or, you know, just spend all your money today because, you know, it's not that exact kind of like carpe diem philosophy, but it's more like we can't really hide from pain. And rather than just 
saying, oh, here's a guidebook on how you can deal with your, you know, uh, anyone can apply these strategies. I really feel like it's absolutely not that because I want to be able to help or advise or admit my mistakes to people who have a wide variety of experiences, beliefs, and all this stuff. So I can say, you know, very frankly in the book, look, I'm Catholic, okay? Let's get that out of the way. And I'm going to view my grasping onto something bigger than reality through my Catholic lens. But you might not have a Catholic lens. You might have your other lens, or you might believe in the universal power of love or whatever it is. But it's this thing that is bigger than the bad news in front of you. Because if you just look at the bad news in front of you, it's just it's just too much to cope with. And and you know the other kind of almost meta lesson I get from this, like you are every day, like just think of your daily schedule and you actually post your daily schedule in the book. Like you had five kids, I don't know, going to different schools, different activities, different needs. You had five children, you, you know, young children. The oldest was 12 when you got your diagnosis. You had five young children that you were dealing with all their needs, plus the career needs. Like you co-write uh, Jim's comedy specials. You you were executive producer and co-wrote the Jim Gaffigan show. You do all of these things that are at like the top of career. And it's interesting to see that through this year plus period, uh, you know, you had, you couldn't focus on that at all, right? You had to focus on you and your health and everything was managed. Not that that automatically gets managed. I feel like you put in 20 years of effort to get to the point where you could hand off things like you, you, you found a great husband. You, you, you had great neighbors. You had a great family that hooked you up with great doctors. And when I was reading this, and I know we're kind of skipping over all the, what actually happened, but when I was reading this, I, there was one part of me that was a little bit sad for me. Of course, I'm going to bring it all back to me. There was where I don't really, I haven't really built up 20 years of siblings and cousins that are going to come to my side and find me the best doctors. Like, I don't know if my kids are going to, you know, be helping me the way, you know, or, you know, I have some of the things that you, you have, obviously I have a great, uh, wife and uh great, and I have good friends, but you had this mega support system that takes decades to build. And I, I felt sorry for myself. Well, that, you know, what if I get sick? Somebody else brought this up to me before they're like, well, at least you were lucky enough to have all this stuff in place. But the truth of the matter was, if you had proposed that this was going to happen to me, I was the type of person who was like, no, Jim, you can't make a sandwich in my kitchen because you can't do it. Like, you don't know how I put stuff in there. It might be mayo on the counter that's going to ruin everything. Like, I was also how, how you, I would have the same reaction. I had no idea that I had this. And I think that's a lot what the book is about, is that it took this, because you have it. You just don't know it, like me. I didn't know it. My husband, I would have never imagined. I mean, he barely washes his own hair. <laughs> like spending an hour being a character. And I mean, it was, it was an eye-opener for me. It made me realize that, oh, yeah, I've been building this for 20 years because I didn't realize it at the time. Is that too, like, deep and weird? Uh, no. I mean, when I think about it, that, that makes sense that maybe when um, – something so world-changing happens like this, it'll come out of the cracks and I'll realize, oh, I had this person, this person, this person. But to be fair, you had nine siblings <laughs> or, or you were one of nine siblings. And that's a big head start because then it's all, and then, you know, you had tons of cousins and they're the ones who hooked you up with the doctors. And, and you know, this is a, a little related. I haven't had a checkup since I was 15 years old. So it made me think maybe I should start thinking about it. But then, so here's where we'll start getting into the details of your story. You're going to the doctor, uh, Dr. Hops or Dr. Hop for one of your yeah, kids. Dr. Hops. And um, she noticed that you were positioning yourself to listen out of one ear. And she's like, what's wrong with your, uh, your left ear? And, uh, and you said, well, I just, I simply <laughs> lost my hearing in that ear. And, and she said, well, you need to get that checked out. 
and that kind of began this whole journey where you realized you had this six centimeter tumor right pushing against your brain stem, which affected almost everything in your body eventually. Uh, maybe we can start with that, even though I just, I gave the intro to it. But, you know, I, I actually just picked up on something like that doctor, like what are the odds that I, I would have a doc? Because, you know, you've all been to doctors who barely look at you. So what are the odds that that day with five kids and all those forms in that room would notice that I was turning my head? So it's just these little tiny moments that now you can look at this and say, oh, isn't she lucky she had this amazing doctor? But it was like all these things. And actually, I have to also, I'm going to get to your exact question, but it also, something prompted me. My cousins in Long Island, I was not taking any of their doctor advice. They were like, doctors, doctors, doctors. And I was like, no, I don't want, I'm not calling you for doctors. I got people for doctors. I'm calling you to go to church and pray to God that I don't die. That's it. I'm not listening. And only later, when I got that doctor, I remember the name. So to me, all those things were like these things that were not in place, but they were like these in, insane coincidences. To me, they can't be coincidences. They are supernatural, like beings, like working, you know, a lot of switches and levers making all this all happen. And and I I believe you. And I also like I really appreciate you saying. Um, whether you're a Catholic or whether it's some sort of higher power, something bigger than you that you could hold on to because that kind of, that bridge between reality and and faith allows you to, to be open to those, whether you call them coincidences or miracles or whatever, it allows you to be open to them and responsive to them and listen to them. Um, but like, for instance, you had your one of your best friends that you grew up with, that became your medical help. The fact that you are the type of person who is able to call someone you grew up with. I don't even know who I could call. But like, and also, I, what are the odds that this person is a, I mean, I, yeah, he wasn't neurologist. my neurologist. <laughs> I mean, it's just all these things. Like, so yes, you can say, okay, I'm, I'm super jealous of Jeannie. And if I get a brain tumor, everyone's going to abandon me. But that's not the point. <laughs> it's a weird, like, that's the weirdest kind of jealousy I've ever heard. The story because it's a, such an amazing story. So it's not like I can say, okay, here's what you do. If you get a brain tumor on your posterior fossa that's this size, um, marry a comedian, um, <laughs> spend 20 years building relationships with, like it's not, I, I don't want that to be the takeaway. Right, right. I think that it's more like I, with even with all these siblings, I was very judgmental of some of my siblings. I love them. You know, just like if you can just apply it to friends, let's say if you're like, you know what? I have no friends. I sit in my room all day, but you do. You have a community of people that you interact with. So let's say substitute friends for siblings. So my siblings, I love them, but I was like this person, you know, I, you know, I bring up my brother, Patrick, who watched my turtle when I went to Florida and the turtle died. So he was not like someone who I'd be like thinking was a caregiver. But what happens to people when someone close to them goes through a crisis is a really meaningful transformation. And if I, I, this is something that for people who are going to know someone who gets sick, that's, it's also a book for them. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. it's like, I mean, I was the type of person, and this is where like karma doesn't make any sense, that if somebody I knew went into the hospital or had sort of a, you know, a private thing and they were just like, you know, miss whoever is in the hospital, I would be like, well, let's not bother her or the family. You know, we'll send them something because I just felt like it wasn't my place. And then when I was in the hospital and I saw the people who were like, yeah, I don't care. I'm just going to go visit Jeannie at the hospital. And people would come in. I was like, this is so meaningful. Would I do this? Because I should. Because I, I talk about, I, you probably know her, Karen Bergreen, who's a comedian friend of mine, came to visit me at the hospital randomly. It was way up at Mount Sinai in the Upper East Side. And she would just be like, when can I visit Jeannie to gym? And would come up and just be funny. Like she'd come in and I was like to tubes and like, you know, looked like shit. And she would come in and be like, 
I don't know what all the fuss is about. Like she's like, I can't believe you're not bald. I came all the way up here and you're not even bald. That's funny. You know, it's just these kind of people that, you know, uh, made me feel like uh, my endorphins would start kicking in when people like that would come in and visit me. Funny people should b- visit people at the hospital. Like that is should be a like, okay, you're funny. Let's get you signed up to visit someone at the hospital. Yeah, and you, you mentioned how when when you first had the surgery and you were having those major complications after the surgery, Jim wasn't funny. And that no. was disappointing to you even it then. It wasn't only disappointing to me. It was I felt like he was angry and he was going to resent me. Mm. If You know, I was like my I had a very strained relationship with him during that time in the hospital. Be, and it made me realize a lot of things. A, uh, even though, yes, I do have five kids, and that's crazy. But I set up a schedule and a life that was unmanageable for anyone but me. And I feel like when I would see Jim come in, I saw that uh, fear of failure, that he was going to fail as the you know mediocre dad. That's what you know he would always say. He's like, I'm not really mediocre at doing all this stuff. And I would also see that he was so he then he had all my family coming in. So you know, if you have one person stay at your apartment, there's a whole different level of chaos. Like even if they're helping, you're like, okay, where's the blankets? You know, we're talking about someone who I've enabled to be like a man child. Do you know what I mean? I'm like the mom. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, okay, here's your stuff or whatever. I mean, not that he can't take care of himself because he was like single till he was 30. He was doing just fine. But the way that I kind of am a hyper caregiver, I just put him in the lineup with the rest of the kids. Although to be fair, when when you had a date that was at where you were supposed to meet him at his apartment, you cleaned up his apartment before he came home. Right. So, cause it was a I, mess. I, I dug my own grave. Yes. <laughs> So he knew I, right then, okay, I, I can have five kids with her. <laughs> for our unhealthy codependency, yes, I do. And also, he's the youngest of six kids, and I'm the oldest of nine kids. And if you know anything about birth order, it's like you find that, you know, so there's some need that I have to take care of someone, mm-hmm. and there's some need he has to be completely taken care of by someone. So yeah, particularly it was those a extremes. role reversal because I was – and so when he came to the hospital, he was not the funny one at all. And only now in retrospect and in writing down the chronology, which is how this book started, was just like me trying to make sense of all of these things because it seemed unbelievable to me because you, I was in a fog and I had a lot of like writings and lists and things. I'd be like, write this down. Like I'd come out of the MRI and it'd be like, this is a funny thing. But all these little things from Dr. Hop saying, Something's wrong with your ear. And then me actually going to an ENT, which is also, you know, something I would put off. Like you say, since, since you were 15, you haven't been to the doctor. I mean, I was pretty similar to that. I mean, I think probably in my 20s, I went through a real hypochondriac stage because I had a, a very young um, aunt die of cancer. So I just thought I had cancer all the time. Like anything was cancer. So I did actually go to the doctor a lot when I was in my 20s. But um, also having five pregnancies, you have to go to the doctor a lot. Well, I had home births, so I really didn't go to the doctor that much. But I did go. I did go to check that everything was okay. I went to the ultrasounds and the first visits to make sure I was okay, and the last visits. Mm-hmm. But I was never a doctor person. Mm-hmm. Um, ironically, I hate hospitals. Um, but um, I've totally lost my train of thought. But I think that what I'm trying to say is that Jim was stressed. He was not, he canceled all his shows, like arenas. You know, it was a big deal. Mm-hmm. And he really felt like he it was over because he saw, it. I didn't know this until I got out and when I was cobbling together this chronology, that it was bad. Like, it was like, they're like, the prognosis is not good. Like, when I had the pneumonia, they couldn't resolve it. So it didn't, I was in the ICU for a long time and I, I wasn't showing any signs of recovery. And even when you got home, you still had the pneumonia. You found I out. I did, but once I was home, Jim knew I was going to get better mm-hmm. because they don't let you go. You, they keep you in the ICU. So the first step was going to like a ICU light, I call it in the book. It's like not a private room, 
like where you're just in a room recovering, but you still are on the floor so the uh, 24-hour nurses can take care of you. But they're not going to take you out of the ICU if you're about to die, right? So there's a, there was a stage where he would, I felt like he got a little warmer. And then when I, when I was released, like the day I got home, he turned into the funny guy again and just completely like changed. But at the time I was in the hospital, there were other funny people visiting me, but it wasn't Jim. Jim was like the, he was the me. He was running everything. He was taking people in and out. He was making shifts for people because when you're in the ICU, you need someone in there. So if you do feel that you're going to have nobody, start making friends now. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm serious. You need somebody that's going to be willing. You know how you always say, like, you know, you know a good friend because they'll help you move or drive you to the airport or whatever? It's like someone who will come visit you in the hospital is a good friend. That should be the – someone who is going to come and sit in the hospital with a sick person on tubes with beeping machines – that is a good friend. Although I, I will uh, remind listeners, you, you mentioned one of your points in the book is – they shouldn't call it. They shouldn't refer to it as a shift. <laughs> shouldn't refer to it as a shift. I mean, I can say shift now, but I didn't like it. I was like a shift. You know, Jim's like it's this person's shift to be with Jeannie. I'm like, it's really that bad. I was like, can't you call it something nice? But also, that's kind of funny too. Yeah. That he called it a shift, and I was offended. Well, well, you know, there was this. Okay, so. This is more in the details of your story, but so you have this this brain tumor. It's not cancerous, but it's so big and it's growing that it's it's pushing against the brain stem in ways that could make the rest of your body, you know, have more and more uh, bad symptoms. Uh, I want to ask you about that in a second, but they they take the brain tumor out, and for the first few seconds of you out of surgery, it seems like you're happy, everything's going to go well, and then suddenly. Boom, you're in the ICU. And I didn't quite uh I wanted to know a little bit more about the okay. leap. Like what I, I get I understood like like the the brain nerves were damaged that were surrounding the the tumor and it's a very complicated surgery because there's so many brain nerves and obviously brain nerves affect the rest of your body. But what exactly happened? Okay, yes. Um good point. And then also just so you know, I they couldn't tell me if it was cancer until like three weeks after the surgery. So oh, really? even at the time we didn't know, but my neurosurgeon told me he thought it was an 80% chance it was not because it was so large that cancer grows so quickly that I, I wouldn't be so high functioning. So um, just to get medical here, the tumor was growing um, probably insidiously for years because of my function, you know, because your, your nerves move around it and grow around it. That's how I could still like walk and talk and breathe because the cranial nerves were all completely compromised. The brainstem is where the 12 cranial nerves are. And they control a lot of things. I won't go into all the medical details, but one of them is speech and swallow and breathing, which is a complicated mechanism. But they're all right next to each other. So when the tumor was removed, it, the surgery was a a great success. Still didn't know if it was cancer, but the tumor itself, like a lot of times when, when you do have cancer, you have to have chemotherapy for a long time before the tumor is operable, right? So this tumor was deemed to be operable because I randomly walked into the, the guy who like invented the way to get rid of these tumors. It was just uncanny. But anyway, so when he took it out, there was a, a photograph that I wished I had included in the book, but I didn't want it to get into the medical section at Barnes & Noble. That is the, this three shots of an MRI of my um, inside of my skull, same position, one with the tumor in it, one the day after the tumor came out, and then six months later or whatever, because they, they monitor like how healed you get. So the day after the surgery it was my brain with a huge hole in it because everything had been pushed. It's an amazing picture. It's just a hole with a black, black hole. So what happened when they took it out is that all those nerves that had been growing around and trying to make their paths um, were very compromised because all of a sudden there wasn't their thing holding it anymore. So um, my swallowing and my breathing got mixed up. Okay, so let me ask you a question. So, um, A, could they have removed 
half, since you were highly functioning oh. with a six centimeter tumor, could they re have removed half of it and keep the side going? That was where your, um, where those nerves, the, the breathing, swallowing and so on were? Um, in, no, but they did do a lot of diagnostic photographs that I didn't go right into surgery. So as you said, it was, uh, something that had been going on for a long time and slowly impacting my health. And the ear, the hearing was the biggest thing. Everything else felt like I was pregnant. So I really kind of thought I was pregnant, right? I was like, oh, pregnant again, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but as you have like tired, dizzy spells, you know, headaches, pregnant, right? It was the hearing loss that was kind of out of the box. But anyway, so, um, but when, the reason why, when they saw it on the Wednesday, I found the doctor on Thursday, they did the diagnostic imaging on, uh, on Friday and then went to the hospital on Monday because it was an emergency. Some of this tumor had to come out because it was, my brainstem was almost like completely gone. Like it was just pushed. There was no, about to be no communication between my brain and my body. So that was one thing. If you look at the pictures, you can see. Right. Um, like one sneeze and I was, you know, it was really good timing. It, it was that close. Like if you had not had the surgery, there could have been a time where there's a tipping point. Uh, absolutely. If you look at the pictures, like I, before um, anyone saw the scan, I tried to get an uh, appointment with a neurosurgeon for a consultation with my report because I only talked to an ENT and who didn't see the scan, who just saw the report, and he, once it was like brain and all this stuff, it was, he can't make decisions. It's like, you can't, you have to be a specialist. So he kind of said, you have to go to a neurosurgeon. So he just had this report that I had a brain tumor. I didn't have like an oral neuroma or whatever they're called, the little uh, tumors that are in your ear, mm. right? There's a, that's a, also a brain surgery to get. So um, I had appointments on the books in May. And I was just going to wait because I'm like, you know, the doctors, they know best, right? And it was my friend that saw the scan and was like, you can't wait. This is like, you need to go like probably to the OR like today. That's what a doctor told me mm -hmm. who saw the scan. So yes, the answer is yes. I mean, could I, I have, could, you know, you play Russian roulette and could I have lasted till two weeks? Maybe because I had lasted that long. But on, like, Sunday night, I was, like, ready to go into—I was, like, I just—I feel like I'm going to have a stroke, like, the night before my surgery because it's it was just, like, all of a sudden I could feel it mm -hmm. when you see something like that. So, anyway, um, so it was very quick. I had to make these decisions about what I was going to do very quickly. But if I'm going to go with this doctor, yes, I am. On um, uh, Friday, they, I spent all day getting imaged. So what they did was map out where all those nerves were. This is getting actually back to the exact answer that you want. And if they look at the nerves and they say, okay, if we take off this half of the tumor, everything's going to be fine. They're, they're making those kind of decisions. But uh, my nerves, particularly actually the most jeopardized nerve was my facial nerve. So it was a very, very likely chance that I wasn't going to have movement in my face, which you've seen people who have had strokes. And I didn't care because I was like, you know, what do I care? I'm already married, you know. <laughs> so, but I'll be alive. So um, that was right in the center. And it was kind of squiggling like an S. So it actually would have been kind of more dangerous to try to remove part of it. And then you're also then kind of making a commitment to another surgery down the line. If you are, take are you, part because of it. let's say you take two thirds out, how many years would it take for it to grow, you know, again to that size? Well, you don't I know mean, how long I, I don't think that the doctor, I mean, that might have been something that someone else might have decided, mm -hmm. but not in my case, but in a in a case where that was possible. But I think that the less surgeries you have, the better, because mm -hmm. um basically these things grow, right? So once you take out some of it, the rest of it's going to still be in there growing. So even if they leave a little tiny bit in, it's going to grow again. So I probably have a little tiny bit of tumor in there that is just like very small and they'll just watch it. And if it gets to the point where they feel like I need radiation, they can get rid of it with radiation, but they do not want to be like, oh, we'll just do another brain surgery in a year if it grows. And is there any way they could have like taken out the tumor 
and maybe put something, and I'm just making this up, could they have put something in place to sort of support the nerves that like were so a, critical? Like a, a pair or a tennis ball? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, what else would you use pairs for? I don't think they do that, but basically they didn't anticipate. They knew it was going to be some recovery. They knew that I would likely be on a feeding tube and a breathing tube to help me until I regained. But what happened, so they had a plan. Like I trust these people like so much. But what happened was, I was very high functioning when I woke up. I wasn't walking around or anything, but I was like on. You know, minute I woke up, I was funny. I was uh, making jokes about you know where you know they were like, where are you? You're breathing. I was breathing, and um, you know they don't give you food or anything like that. But when I went to sleep, I was kind of a deep sleep because I had the drugs still in my body, and apparently I breathed in my saliva, mm -hmm. and. What like what, that's what happens when people drown, right? They breathe in water into their lungs, and what happened was is that it infected my lungs while I was sleeping, and the pneumonia got uh, bad to the point where I couldn't breathe. So they intubated me, you know, with that big plastic tube yeah. down the throat, and um, that's how I woke up. So all of a sudden, I had woken up and seen everyone smiling, and I fell asleep, and then I woke up, and it was like emergency, beeping, like plastic tube. I couldn't move. It was, and then I, you know, spent the next, like, couple of weeks like that. Were so. you scared right when you, I mean, obviously, this is a dumb question, but were you scared uh, right that moment when you woke up? This the second wake up with the yeah. tube? Yeah. No. I but was. Like, what, what, I always wonder, what's that like to wake up and that, Tubes like it's like a vacuum tube, and it's like going down your throat. It's it, and that's really how you're breathing. I don't know how I would. It was react. awful. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I obviously have spent a lot of time moving around. I used to live just in Airbnbs, but uh, now that I rent an apartment. I do want it to look good. I do want to feel good in it. And it's critical to have good lighting. When I go into my apartment, I like to just turn on the lights and it just makes me feel better. Fortunately, we have a new sponsor that helps with this. Lamps Plus has been helping customers love their everyday spaces for over 40 years with chandeliers, ceiling lights, table lamps, and more. And the light itself, it's like jewelry for the home. Lamps Plus is the nation's largest lighting retailer with over 55,000 designs from top brands and their own exclusive designs in lighting, home furnishings, and decor. You don't have to guess at what the designs will look like or wander around all these aisles of these big box stores. Lamps Plus has videos with design tips and all the photos on their site to tell you which light fixtures or furniture pieces are featured. So it's easy to buy what you like. They also have a large selection of Minka Lavery lighting to transform your home into wonderful living areas. Minka Lavery is known for designs that blend function and style using innovative materials. So get up to 50% off hundreds of lights, furniture, and decor between November 25th and December 24th. That's up to 50% off during the Lamps Plus holiday sale, which is happening from November 25th through December 24th. Go to L-A-M-P-S-P-L-U-S lampsplus.com slash James to start saving today. That's lampsplus.com slash James. So I really was not scared. I, I Everyone else looked terrified in the room. I saw it in their faces. And I was really pissed. I was angry. That's what I remember feeling. I was like, I thought I was leaving. I thought I was done. Like, it was just like, I was so irritated. Like, that's the feeling. I just remember being like, because I had no idea what was going on. And in later, Jim told me, you know, we told you you had pneumonia and all this stuff. I'm like, what are you, I just had brain surgery. I didn't hear anything. Like, I don't remember anyone being like, oh, by the way, you're now in the ICU. You had pneumonia and you're, you're intubated. I was like, everyone was talking. And I was like, just this like coma ghost. But I was awake. Could could you could you do anything? Like no. could you could you I, write? No, I couldn't do anything. So nobody even knew you couldn't communicate really. And my eyes. Mm -hmm. I was like, Jim would say, she's she's yelling at me. <laughs> my eyes were like, you know, I it was like I couldn't 
I couldn't communicate except with my eyes. And I should say I, because the one was slumped down because the, the nerves were messed up. And um, I was just like, why? What is happening? Because basically nobody came. This is, was a very frantic situation. People were running around. Oh, thank you very much. Um, people were running around. They were worried. Jim was scared. There were people coming in and out, nurses, doctors. And I was just there like this, you know, ghost who couldn't say, what the hell is going on? Someone sit down and explain to me what's going on. Show me a chart. What is happening? And so the next few days were very chaotic for me. But I wasn't scared because there was something that happened to me that when I woke up from that surgery, I was so aware of myself in a way that I'd never been before because when I went in, I realized it might be the last time I could recognize anyone. Mm -hmm. You know how when you, I mean, we all, I don't know, we all, but, or someone we know has someone who like suffers from like Alzheimer's or dementia and like they start saying like, they don't recognize me anymore or, mm -hmm. you know, and all of a sudden, when you're when I was going into that thing, I was like, "What if I come out of this and I don't recognize anyone, and I'm I'm not me?" You know, it's just such an amazing concept. So when the second I woke up, I knew it was me, and I realized I woke up and I you know heard the beeping and I saw like doctors walking around. It was in like a re recovery area, and I just was like, "Oh my god, I had the surgery." I'm thinking to myself, "I'm me. I I'm." I am, you know, I think therefore I am, you know, and it was so amazing and I was so happy. And then all of a sudden I was like in the situation where no one was talking to me. I had this big plastic tube that was breathing for me. I was like, what's going on? And it was, it was, uh, I wasn't like, oh my God, I wasn't scared at all. I was like, I already went through the scary part. I didn't realize that I should have been scared at that point. I was just mad that I thought I was done with this. You know, it's like if you, you know, took took a huge test or something. And they're like, okay, that was just the warm-up. And you're like, but I just studied for this test and was like, yeah, I'm about to, like, crack open a beer. And they're like, no, no, that's, now you have to do the real test. Like, that's how I felt. It was like, I was irritated. You know, I wasn't, I was not, a, I, there was not pleasant thoughts going through my head. And so now you're, in the ICU, you're you're being fed through a tube. You're being and the tube's going up your nostril, up down into your stomach. Yeah. You're you're intubated with the the big plastic. Yeah. Why didn't they immediately just do? Why did they? Th why did they need the? Why didn't they just do the tracheotomy immediately and the the uh, tube right into the stomach immediately? You know that is um, something that I talked to the doctor about. Because at a certain point when he was like, well, we could do a tracheotomy because it was about me leaving. And I was like, well, let's just do the tracheotomy. And it's like, oh, some people don't want the scar. And all that. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, I would love the scar. I would love the scar. But I also think that the, the breathing tube is an immediate thing. Like if you hear like, uh, you know, those things that doctors yell out in emergency rooms, it's usually, you know, the, about the intubation. you It's much more complicated to do a tracheotomy when you could just stick a tube down someone's throat. And a, like, I was probably choking to death. Mm. And then, you know, it's like that was working to keep me alive. Mm. So it wasn't like, why didn't they do this? or what? You know what I mean? It wasn't that kind of thing. Later on, where I was given the choice to go home or stay in the hospital a little bit longer, but I still couldn't breathe on my own. So... I was like, tracheotomy, 100%. I'm going to go for tracheotomy. And also the nasal gastric. It was like, I was so happy to get that food tube because it was just so much stuff in my face, you know? And, and so, so you know, throughout I sound this, horrible, I know. I sound like such an ungrateful patient. No, no, no. It was it's, bad. It's, it's, it's scary and interesting at the same time, like all the decisions that are happening and and you know, w what decisions are made and why. So you're there uh, in the ICU. At this point, like you said, people are visiting, friends, family. Jim's putting everyone on shifts. People were also taking care of the kids. Jim, you know, sort of, you know, 
somehow choreograph that. And uh, I don't know, at some point, did you, I mean, and again, I feel like this is a stupid question, but like, were you getting depressed after a day, two days, a week, two weeks? Must have been. It was terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. And I think that I talk about going into that dark, that darkness where there's no hope. And I, I mean, this is really dark, but I never in my life could understand it ever when people would be like, oh, if I, you know, you just pull the plug, you know, people who would pull the plug. I was like, who would ever want to pull the plug? And when I was in that situation, I was like, I get it. I understand why people don't want to live like this because it's horrible. I, I'm not saying that I was faced with that, but I, I got it. I understand it. I don't know if I would do it. You know, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you want to end it. I wanted it to end. And it was really dark. And then I was having dreams or hallucinations or something about being on this boat in this darkness, this cold black water around these rocks that had all this, like, briar on it. And I was like, this is death. Like, I'm going to my death. And then I started, and I was really depressed. And then I actually talk about, let me let me uh, go back for a second before I talk about death. I was, um, I missed my kids so much. I didn't realize how much I would, I, like, that there's an actual, like, weird, like, mother-child bond that makes uh, everything that's, like, been happening, like, the border and stuff much more real to me about, like, separating people. There's something that's so isolating about not being touched. And I think that as an adult, like, we just think of being touched as, like, you know, a sexual thing because it's if you don't have kids. But kids touch you all the time. Like, kids touch you all the time. And if you don't have little kids, you, you don't really get touched that much. But I get touched all the time. Hug, kiss, lap, pick them up, touch, like physical human contact. And I didn't have any anymore. So it was at the same time as I also didn't have food or water. And there is something also, the act of drinking a sip of water, which I talk about in the book, never ever noticed it before. Now I love it. Um, or swallowing food that actually stimulates the part of your brain that, like, wants to live, mm -hmm. right? So I had two, like, fastings going on. I couldn't eat or drink. I mean, I was still being kept alive by these, like, this gunk that was going into my nose um, that was some kind of formula of protein or something. And um, no water, nothing. And... Um, no touching. No one was touching me. And maybe sticking needles. That was how, that was my like like that kind of touching. Like a like I was kind of an animal. Mm -hmm. And even even these great nurses, it's like you just don't have any real human connection. And so I actually talk about in the book is that I was so confused by these feelings because I was just deprived immediately, and I couldn't really communicate it with anyone. Um, which is another reason I wrote it all down because it's like I had to process this. You can't just go through this something and be like, well, back to picking up the kids at school. I had to write the book also for me to make sense of what had just happened. But so I, I started to have these dreams about, um, you know, getting close to this barren, horrible thing that was just outside of, like, life and love. And... That's when I felt this, like, you know, innate desire to connect with a higher power. And I was like, I need, listen, God, you know, I was just starting talking to God. I was like, I need to get out of this. I need to, um, I, it's, I love my life so much. And I, I will do anything. I started bargaining. You know, I talk about how, my feelings got so confused my because it's like I'm recovering from brain surgery. I'm not eating, I'm not seeing anyone. And I, I joke in the book that I'm afraid when I actually do see one of my kids, I might forget and might accidentally eat one of them because I, I was so confused by my feelings. Um, and I'm glad no one in the room laughed at that. Anyway, <laughs> I did um, a little tough bit, crowd, but <laughs> tough crowd. Okay. So, um, but you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like I, it was just this kind of deprivation that was just 
awful. And um, that's when I really felt that God was speaking to me and being like, no, no, this is just a thing. And you're going to come out of this. And when you do, you it's going to be really hard for you not to just fall back into your, like, kind of letting life just go by. And you blink your eyes and your kids are moving out. Like, that's how I was living. Even when I left the show. Because I was like, I can't work 80 hours a week and have five kids. It's just not manageable. Right, right. So just to mention, <laughs> you guys had produced two excellent seasons of The Jim Gaffigan Show. One of my favorite shows at the time. I was so disappointed when there wasn't a season three. But as you explain in the book, you really made a decision that, you know, you needed those years to spend time with your kids. You yeah, didn't wanna... I just, I mean, if I could, if he would take someone else as a showrunner, like in my place, um, I could have done it because I could have popped in, you know, I could have worked a normal week. I think that women should work and have kids. I think it's absolutely 100% true. But it was like the showrunner, executive producer, head writer. It was too much work because I was literally, my priorities were getting screwed up because I also had this amazing family at the show. And also we had this relationship with New York where if you were a comedian and you lived in New York, you were going to be on our show. Like we had the fantasy of being like all of our friends and these funny people that we've been killing ourselves with for the past 20 years are getting a part on our show. They're going to do a bit. They're going to do a character. They're going to do whatever. So I had this amazing relationship where the creative fulfillment of that show and how we just, especially season two, we were just like, what if Jim has a fantasy that he's like, you know, on Game of Thrones, you know? And we would be able to do these crazy things. It was amazing. And But at the same time, my kids started to get, older and like teachers would call me and be like, we think Katie has strep throat. And I'd be like, oh, I'm shooting a scene. Can someone go pick up my daughter and take her to the doctor to get, and all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, what is happening? And I started to feel like yucky about myself. So I was like, I really need to be able to leave. I need a job where I don't have to be there all the time. So because it was loosely based on our life, it was really difficult for Jim to to have someone else write like his voice because I'd already been writing his voice since like, I probably started writing for him in like 2002 Hmm. with him. Um, Before that I was doing some producing for him, but he was very resistant to like, he's like, yeah, yeah, you don't understand comedy, you know? And, um, but I started being like, well, you know, a better way to end that, you know, doing that kind of mini collaboration with him because it's like, you can't be with someone like Jim for so long and not be a like, you know, if you're going to do like 20 minutes on bacon, let me pitch a couple of bacon jokes to you too. You know, it's like, it lends itself to a partnership. So essentially, um, I was, where, what was I talking about? Well, just, just the idea that you had already made this big decision to yeah. focus on the kids. And, and when I came home, I just was, um, I just was inundated with um, life. We were producing another special right away. I was doing like a short film. So I had a, a job, you know, regular job. Jim was on tour. I had five kids. And I was like, okay, this is better because I'm here. But at first when you get home, you're still, you got the tracheotomy, you got the food. Oh, sorry, too. I'm jumping around. I'm talking, I thought you were talking about when I left the Jim Gaffigan show and came home. Oh, okay, yeah, we can talk about that too. So whichever... All right, let me just quickly yeah. touch on that because it's going to go right back to the hospital. So I moved home and I was like, ah, here I am giving up this amazing uh, show, the my best job ever because I'm going to do the right thing and be with my kids. But then I kind of started running them like I was running a show. You know, I was like, okay, it's time, you know, it's back to school time, time for your wardrobe fitting. I mean, I make <laughs> jokes about it, but I was like not really experiencing the moments of like a little bit of chaos, a little bit of like, n- let's not do anything on Saturday, you know, that kind of thing. And I didn't realize that until I was like almost dead. So I felt like this experience that I had to go out of my crazy life and be like cloistered into this like, um, ridiculous monastery of fasting from everything to have this like enlightenment. And, and that's when I realized I need to like start saying no to things. I need to only do things that interest me um, 
forget about, like, I, I have, we have money. Do you know what I mean? Like, what are we doing? Why are we killing ourselves? For what? You know, let's do something. And if people don't like it, then they don't think they can watch something else. They can change the channel. And so we just started, uh, I mean, anyway, well, we we started now. This is post book. But it, the book is the story of how I really felt that in the ICU that I had this conversation with God. God gave me this confidence. You are going to get better. And you, you know, might think, oh, well, she was just reaching her inner self or whatever, whatever you want to think. This is how I perceive it. But I believe that I changed my life because of this experience. And I started doing things that had meaning to me. And I started tasting water. And when, once I had went through all the therapy and the swallowing and all that stuff and learned to swallow. So is, is that hard to relearn to swallow after months of not swallowing? It's not only hard to relearn, but it's also physiologically like a challenge because you don't even think about it, right, when you swallow something. And and for the past two years, I've been working on like squeezing my muscles together through exercises to be able to swallow and not choke. So, yeah, it's a whole thing. But I can't complain because I'm, I'm drinking water. I can – the first year I could drink water. Hmm. I could I'd put thickener and stuff. You know, but I I still had to have the food peg because I was I you can get water really fast, but it's really difficult to swallow water. It's actually much easier to swallow something like applesauce or something that's nectar thick because the gravity pulls it down your throat. Water like just comes right out your nose. What about like a cookie? Well, can I eat a cookie now? Or then? I mean, when you no. first started learning to swallow, was that harder than water? No, I was like applesauce. Mm -hmm. That's what I could swallow. Like a cookie or bread? No. Like how long would it take to relearn to swallow bread? I, like, I need to know for my own personal reasons. <laughs> but like, I don't know, like a year and a half. For oh me, I God. think for everyone it's different. But I, I went to speech and swallow therapy. I mean, I still kind of talk like I'm drunk, but I'm working on it. Like it's not something that I can just be like, well, I've done with this therapy. I mean, I just was on a, uh, a show in Chicago where one of the producers – um, is in physical therapy, had a brain tumor 10 years later. So it's like, I'm doing really well. Like, I can't complain. I, I Now I don't go every week anymore. You know, I just go, I'm having another surgery on my vocal cords on um, December 20th, right in time for the holidays, um, because I have a um, paralyzed left vocal cord. It's all in there, you know? It's like the 12 cranial nerves. Like, I I. I think that I learned a lot about medicine too and about physiology in this experience. But speech, swallow, and um, breathing, they're all in the same area. And the nerves are in the same area, but they're all th work independently of each other. So um, my vocal cord, the only thing that really um, didn't come back was my left vocal cord. Like everything else is like, you know, I have glasses now, I have a hearing aid things like that, little assistance, but I, everything is coming back um, except for the left vocal cord. So I had a surgery called, this is probably really boring to everyone, but I had a surgery called a type 1 thyroplasty and uh, adenoid adduction. Um, and um, they took an implant and put and like kind of banded together, this is a, the very layman's terms, the right vocal cord, which is doing great, and the left one, which is like dead, so that they would work together. But it's also a spastic paralysis, so every once in a while it like pops in. It's very weird. But they think that the implant that they put in is too large because I can't make I can't make a full sound and I can't like sing happy birthday. I can only speak in this range. So on the twentieth, they're going to actually do another surgery where they're going to take out the implant and and uh, make it smaller and then put it back in in the same incision. And they think that will. And they think that after, like, a, a two months, I'll be able to, like, you know, there's a 50-50 chance that I'm going to either sound like this, which, you know, is not bad. It's not great, but – or I'm going to recover. So – So now you you, yeah. you you got home 
with all the tubes and everything, yeah. was your family, like your kids, were they, this is the first time they're really seeing you, yeah. you know, daily, all, all the, were they shocked? Were they scared to approach you or? They really weren't because this nurse, Bruce, who, who lived in down, your building, lived in my building, love him. I'm still very good friends with him. Um, sat them all down and told them the whole story. They're like, look, your mom is going to have a hole in her neck with a big tube coming out of it. She's going to have a hose. She's going to be in bed. You can't touch her here. You can't touch her there. Like he gave the, so he portrayed it like probably 10 times worse than it was. And, but he also empowered them. And there, there was like, uh, you're going to be the one who does, brings this pillow for her feet. And you're going to be the one. So they all came in and were like, Hey, mom, we understand you have a tracheotomy. It was amazing. It was just such a beautiful experience. I mean, like six months later, when I started to get better, they started to be like horrible, but that's a different book. And so, so six months later, when was there a point where you said, okay, I feel like things are getting back to normal? They're not normal, but, and I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but. When did you feel inside like, okay, I'm beginning my life again? Pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I probably when I had lost the oxygen tank, when I didn't have to have the oxygen tank with me where I, whenever I left the house, that was like the sidekick, you know, like the, you know, what is it? The drone in, in Star Wars that goes with you. Oh yeah. Like R2-D2. Yeah. Or... Like R2-D2. Yeah. That was like the bad R2-D2. Yeah. So I got rid of that and I felt really free, even when I still had the peg tube, because I also started to be able to swallow stuff before I got rid of the peg tube. And I would just use the peg tube for like crushed medicine, like things that were really difficult to swallow. And I started, um, you know, applesauce and then um, what- I, Was that like a great moment? The oh, first yeah. time applesauce was on your tongue? It was a little, it was only disappointing because Jim was just like, we're gonna have a steak. Like he, he, cause you had to pass a barium test, which is a type of, um, uh, paste that they mix with water and then you swallow it and they can see on the x-ray if it goes down the right way or if you aspirate it. And so I had taken several of these tests and not passed them because the two, they could see how it goes down through the x-ray. They're like, no, she's going to like die if she swallows. So eventually I passed the barium test. And so Jim was like, yay, you passed. We're going to have a steak dinner. And they were like one teaspoon of applesauce, you know? So it wasn't like this big Eureka thing. The anticipation of swallowing the applesauce was amazing. But then when it was like, you have applesauce, I was like, okay, that's, you know, I, and then there was also like, there was this coffee thing. Cause I love coffee. And at a certain point, because I was, you know, I felt exhausted all the time because recovering is a lot of work. So my neurosurgeon, not my gastroenterologist or any of these other like specialty doctors, he was like, why don't you put a cup of coffee in your peg tube? And yeah. I was like, can you do that? Wouldn't it like rot your stomach? He's like, it's going exactly the same. It's just you're not drinking it. He's like, it's just going right in. It's the same. It's a great idea. Place. <laughs> and I put. Uh, coffee in the peg tube and I felt great because it's a drug. Coffee this should be like a, a little invention, like just a tiny tube where you could just pour coffee in yeah, all day. Yeah, you'd just be doing it all day like a colostomy bag. Right. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. But so when I got to drink coffee, it would come out my nose because I couldn't swallow. It was too thin. I mean, it's very complicated, but you, I couldn't grip the swallow. So... I'd have to put this thickener in it. You know, have you ever heard of like elderly people, they have to put thickener in their juice and stuff like that? Well, anyway, it's a thing. And it's so disgusting because you have to put this like cornstarch in your coffee. And I'm like, I'd rather just, I'd kind of miss nothing in my mouth. You know, I could rather just put it in the peg. So there was this period of time where, no, it wasn't normal. But when I lost the oxygen tank, I went to, um, Alaska with uh, my family in August. And it turned, we had traveled a few places to like see people. When I got rid of the oxygen tank, I could go in a car and 
things like that. I needed to like see, you know, it was like the summer. I was so happy. And then Jim was doing the Alaska State Fair. And he was like, we're all going to go to Alaska. And I was like, great. And I, the pictures of the on the brochure looked like it was like the Four Seasons of Alaska. Like it looked like the Disney version of Alaska. I was like, I'll be looking out a window at a beautiful lake or whatever. And when we got there, it was like by like this like like old military seaplane. And it was in the middle of nowhere with no roads. And I'm like, I'm like recovering from brain surgery. Like what, what's happening? And Jim's like, I really didn't think it was going to be so remote. I'm like, you didn't research this trip. And what happened was, is that on this, and this whole story is in Jim's act. So I don't want to like steal it, but he literally had a uh, appendicitis and I, he was airlifted off of this little like remote island in Alaska, leaving me recovered from brain surgery with five kids with like bears roaming the campsite. And that's when I felt like things were back to normal. Right. Cause you could, you could now take charge of a situation and survive it. Yeah. Like this, that, that, and so in a weird way it empowered you. It probably even made you stronger mentally knowing that you could handle this, you know, high stakes situation by yourself. Yeah, because before that, it was like, help Jeannie out of the car. You know, I was like a 90-year-old woman. Hmm. You know, I, I had a cane. So it was like all of a sudden, I was in a situation where I was in charge of like five kids in the wilderness. And that's when I felt like, okay, I got it. I could do it. And then Jim was back the next day, okay. Yeah, but he, I had no idea. But yeah. I was like, I, I knew everything was going to be okay. I was like, we've been through... Like, just take it one day at a time. Like, just enjoy. You know, I, I, my old me would have been like, okay, we got to charter a boat. We're going to get all the kids to Anchorage, and I'm going to sit in the waiting room. And then I was like, you know what? If, when the, if the, because there's no phones, right? I'm like throwing things. <laughs> there's no phones. So there's like CB radios. And I'm going into the cabin to be like, can you call the hospital and see if my husband's dead? <laughs> and, um, but I was like, you know what? What are we going to all be doing in the in the waiting room with five kids at a hospital? Like, I can't do anything. What am I going to go and go and spend right, like every five reception is streamed to see five kids and a wife. And, and if then... it's if it's something because we didn't know it was appendicitis. Like I, I now we all know it was appendicitis. But he was like dying of something. You know, it was like. But I was like, if I'm needed to go. I will like, will I get a, a freaking airlift myself hmm. and go? But why would I charter a boat for four hours, get to Anchorage to be in a, in a waiting room in a hospital? It like all of a sudden I realized I'm just gonna stay here in this beautiful area and like wait till someone says you're needed. And th that was a big thing for me because I, even if I wasn't needed before, I'd be like, I'm needed. People would be like, we don't need you. And I'd be like, yeah, no, you do need me. So, so, right. So there's, so you mentioned this, you know, towards the end of the book, like what has changed a little since, since the surgery, since, since these moments or since this, this year. Um, but what, this is one of the things where suddenly you, you felt like you didn't have to take charge of everything. Right, you didn't have to make every single decision. You could relax a little bit. Although there's one point where you say, you know, immediately afterwards, you were like, "Oh, I don't sweat the small stuff." But then a year later, you say, "Oh, now I I'm back to sweating the small stuff." Yeah. But what do you think globally has? And uh, I almost hate asking this question because it's a cliche question. But what do you think globally has changed philosophically for you? Like you had a big philosophical change with when you left the TV show and you said, "Look, family." First, this is important. Even though this is a dream job, it's not as important as family. But this is much more high stakes. Like you could have died and then you were out of action for, for months or a year. What what were some of the what were some of the revelations or, or ways your behavior actually changed? This is one of them that you mentioned, not having to go to Anchorage. Right. I mean, that's it's a, it sounds crazy, but I would just like kind of I think insert myself in the position into situations and be like, I'm the the boss, you know what I mean? And I, let me, I have to, I, my husband's going to have his appendectomy. I want to meet the doctor. I'm going to find out if that's the right guy. 
you know, and I was just like, I, I just felt like this much more of like, I'm not, I'm no expert. Like those people, he's in good hands. I don't want to insert myself. So that is a minor thing, but that's a big like microcosm of my life. Yeah, it's not, it's not a minor thing. Cause let's say on a daily basis, you have to make a thousand decisions. Now you're sort of saying, look, maybe instead of a thousand decisions, really what's important is 400 decisions. Right, right. And I'm, I'm, so I'm going to subtract 600 decisions from my daily life. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good analogy. But I also think that I walking away from this, um, just one word, gratitude. I am so grateful for like, they, I, I find myself understanding because I'm still compromised. I think that when I'm 100% better, it's going to be harder to remember how grateful I am to be alive. Right now, I have reminders all the time because, I'm, because it's not that easy to swallow. And I still have to go to the doctor. And I still have going, you know, I, I can't believe that I'm, you know, alive. Like, I still have that really buzzy, uh, I'm back thing um, going. And then writing the book and then having it resonate. Like, it was like all this stuff. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is, I'm so lucky. I can't believe this is happening. Thank you. Um, but also, the fact is, is that I'm not you know, going to say, um, you know, this changed my life. And now I'm just like smelling the roses and not because it's like I am who I am. You know, I am a like type A personality. Like I have five kids. I'm not, you know, moving to the wilderness and deciding to be a nudist or something and not have any care in the world. But I think that the difference is, though, is that. Um, yes, okay, I am sweating the small stuff because I think that sweating the small stuff like actually helps me. It's like therapy for me. I'm like, I can't believe that there's a mouse, you know, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that like if I didn't have that opportunity to say, if I was just like, oh, yeah, a mouse just ran across my living room floor. I don't care at all. I, I just feel like I wouldn't get that kind of therapeutic like, like I'm almost in, like saying, okay, I like kind of overreacting to the mouse because now I see that it's part of a funny comedy story. Whereas before it was just about the moment of like, oh, this is the end of the world. So now I look at little, uh, the small stuff that I sweat as part of a larger funny story. What about in terms of ambition? Like you know, during the during the arc of our career, at different points, you're ambitious, and that's what pushes you to higher and higher levels of career. Now, after this, and facing mortality, has kind of your perspective on ambition changed? A you little are bit? a great interviewer. That question is amazing. <laughs> well, but thank you I'm so, so much. I'm so grateful. <laughs> um, I um, absolutely. It is so different, and I mean, and because it's like if I. You know, the book did really well, by the way. And I am i don't feel the same way. I'm very grateful for that. But had it, had three people read it, I would, I feel very like I wasn't, maybe I felt a little bit more like I wanted to like uh, impress Jim, you know, because, you know, a little competition with Jim. But I, there was, I wasn't like ambitious about this book. I had no like design on, getting on the New York Times bestseller list. I had no goal of that. The fact that that happened is like just amazing. I just can't believe it. It's like, I'm like, whoa, that was, you know, very, uh, you know, zen that that happened because it wasn't like, you know, something where like, oh, I'll be definitely a failure if I'm not, you know, it wasn't like that kind of thing. And I think that in other times of my life, I kind of valued who I was um, by what I produced and what accomplishments that I had had. And, um, and I, and I count and my kids too, like, are my kids going to be impressive to other people? I didn't really realize that now until I don't feel that way anymore. Now I just feel like I want to, um, be happy and like love people and be a good person. And in, I, and also, like, isn't it amazing that we that that Jim and I do what we love and we're like successful at it? It's like 
if you don't have that perspective, you understand why people who are like on top of the world are like, I'm miserable, I'm gonna overdose on drugs. You know, it's like, you have to understand that like, I, you know, would I feel this way if I was like, um, you know, cleaning toilets all day? I hope so. I hope I would feel this way. But this is like where I wound up. And I'm so grateful for it, but I don't feel like I have anything to prove. I don't have to prove. And also when I when I uh, was writing the book, you know, Jim was like, you know, people are, some people are going to be really mean and not like the book. And I'm like, I so don't care because they don't have to read it. You know, it's like, I, I understand how people cannot like things or like things. And that's why you live in a world where you can change the channel. So I just don't have any, um, I, I care about, I care about humanity and I care about what other people think and about hurting their feelings, but I don't really feel, um, scared or nervous or insulted if someone doesn't like my book or my the way I raised my kids or the fact that, that I had home births or the fact that I didn't put an artificial tumor in my brain to make the nerves better or whatever. I don't have any, you know, I'm like, oh, that's an interesting perspective, but I, I feel like something changed where I just feel like growing that brain tumor was my biggest accomplishment. Now I can retire. <laughs> Well, uh, Jeannie Gaffigan, author of When Life Gives You Pears, uh, you know, the story of your brain tumor. And also you have a really uh, beautiful section, the story of your relationship with, with Jim and how it started and, and so on. And uh, I have to say the, the book was not only a page turner for me, but the second I finished the book, I just felt this need to go into my daughter's room and sit down and talk with her for a while in part selfishly, because I want to make sure she shows up if I have a brain tumor. Nice. But in part, just because, I don't know, your, your book made me want to do that. And it's a, it's just a really beautiful book, beautifully written, and, and, uh, just mind-boggling story. And, and you tell it so well, and it's a story I haven't read before. And thanks for, for writing it. Thanks for coming on the podcast and, and answering my questions. And I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank and, you. And, and good luck on your, your next surgery. And hopefully we'll be hearing out of both of your vocal cords after, you know, December, January, whenever. You, I'll be you... coming and singing an aria. Excellent. I'm going to hold you to that. We have a stage downstairs. I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> At least happy birthday. I'll get to that high note. All right. My birthday is on January 22nd. Oh, nice. That's want my you goal. want to call me and, and sing happy birthday. <laughs> Amazing. I think I'm going to. Excellent. Thanks, Jeannie. Thank you. Hang on, don't go yet. I want to remind you, I want you to have a copy of what I think is one of my best books that I've ever written, Reinvent Yourself. This book was so important to me because I've had to reinvent my career from scratch so many times that I learned all the techniques that really helped me to reinvent myself, to master a new area of life, to thrive. All you have to do is go to www.reinventbook.net that's www.reinventbook.net. I'm excited about what this book can do for you, and you should be as well. The next step, claim your copy before they're gone. Just go to www.reinventbook.net to learn more. That's www.reinventbook.net. These days, we're all investors trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information.